house. That if I had to sign away my house and I was heading for a situation where someone was going to call that in and I was going to be homeless, then I had to turn around. Now, I have never quite gotten there. I've gotten, I can, I've gotten to within inches of that line, but I never got there. And that's my personal, don't go past that. Uh, I think that every business owner really needs to figure out what they're willing to sacrifice and think about it very clearly. Like, are you willing to sacrifice the health of your personal relationship? Welcome to the Small Business Show. I'm Shannon Jean, and we hope you're enjoying the holidays with family and friends, just like Dave Hamilton and I are doing this week. Today, we are revisiting one of my favorite shows with Paul Downs, New York Times small business contributor and author of Boss Life. Paul's story is unique, and his concept of sharing his business failures with the world is something that you won't soon forget. Learn along with us as we revisit our talk with Paul Downs, author of Boss Life. Small Business Show, episode number 83 for Wednesday, September 7th, 2016. And welcome to the Small Business Show, the show by, for, and about small business owners here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. How, How are goes, you, sir? I'm good, man. How's it going? <laughs> good, How's good. Going? Yeah, yeah, good. So I'm, I'm sure it's a busy day for you. You guys, you're just wrapping up another podcast with all the Apple announcements, I yeah, imagine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Actually, and, that's and cool. between that one and this one, I squeezed in a Gig Gab podcast because we were running late on that this week. So it's been a uh, it's been a crazy day. But yeah, yeah, all the crazy yeah. new iPhone 7 and Watch 2 and, and <laughs> AirPods and everything else has been yeah. occupying my morning. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I'm looking yeah. forward to, uh, to getting it. But hey, uh, I'm really excited. Excited today, you know. We're we, we've talked about this book, uh, Boss Life, a few times on the show, and how it had such a, a profound impact on me. And uh, uh, you know, hearing another business owner's you know really true, transparent story. And we're fortunate enough to you know be joined today by Paul Downs. Uh, owner of Paul Downs Custom Conference Tables, the small, uh, former small business blogger for the New York Times, and author of Boss Life. Paul, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Yeah, we're, uh, I'm stoked to have you on the show and, uh, really glad you give us some of your time today. Um, talk about your, your business a little bit before we get started and, you know, just, just tell our listeners, you know, how you got started, uh, wh- what your main focus is for those of, of them who have not read the book, even though I've been yelling about it for the last three weeks. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are a manufacturer of custom conference and boardroom tables, uh, we deal mostly with sort of big, complicated projects, and uh, we sell to big organizations, the government, medium-sized organizations, small organizations, and just about everybody who needs a custom conference table. Um, I've been in business for 30 years now, and I started when I was quite young, fresh out of college, started off making furniture for the residential market, and then made a transition into office furniture in the early 2000s. And we currently employ 19 people, and we do about $3 million a year. I have a 35,000-square-foot workshop just outside Philadelphia, and that's us. Nice. Did, did, so before you got into that, that furniture business, did you, did, did you work somewhere else? Did you have training, or is it, was it just something that you loved to do and thought, hey, can we you know, make no. a business out of this? I never had been I, – I, I'm not one who's really well-suited to working for other people. And I started the company when I was uh, 23 years old. Uh, I had no experience in furniture at all, but I had a lot of experience in working with my hands when I was younger. And I got into the furniture business because I had graduated from the uh, University of Pennsylvania architecture program and was thinking of going on <clears throat> to get a graduate degree and decided to work construction for a summer. And I was a carpenter's helper for a gentleman who really wanted to be a furniture maker. And he was always going on about how great that would be. And he made it sound so good. I was like, dang, I'm going to try that. So <laughs> uh, I had a small amount of money that I had inherited from my grandmother, a couple of thousand dollars and a lot of confidence. And I just decided I was going to give it a spin and uh, 
So I put together some tools in a shop and started making things. And, you know, that's how a lot, how many people start uh, making furniture, but most of them go broke pretty quick. And I was fortunate in that I was able to not only build things, but I'm pretty good at designing and I was persuasive. So I was able to talk customers into giving me money. And uh, that was the start of the business. And over the years, we grew and added employees. And so here we are today. Oh, that's great. Uh, so fast forward, uh, uh, you know, a number of years. And how did you get involved with, uh, you know, the, the small business uh, blog on the New York Times? What was the uh, connection there that, that got you involved in writing with them? Well, it's a sort of a funny story. So like like most uh, most businesses in this country, we grew in the early 2000s and then we really got into trouble in 2008 when the recession arrived. And at the uh, you know, in August of 2008, I had 23 employees. And uh, by October, I had cut that in half. I had to lay half the guys off. And that was kind of an awful day. And then throughout 2009, uh, our business was just dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And by the end of the year, I was down to six employees. And I was pretty sure that I was actually about to go out of business. This was mid-December 2009. I was down to maybe three or $4,000 in the bank. And uh, we had no orders on our books and I started thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm actually going to go out of business. What am I going to do? I'd been my own boss for 24 years, and uh, I was trying to figure out what would actually happen, what what it would be like to drive a business into the ground. <laughs> and uh, went on the Internet and started looking around for anybody who talked about this and really found nothing, like literally nothing. Now, all those years leading up to this moment, I had been a reader of the New York Times, and particularly its online edition. And in the summer of 2009, they had launched a blog in the business section called You're the Boss, and it was aimed at small business owners. And the editor had rounded up a bunch of contributors who were either small business owners writing about their experience or people who were consultants, basically, writing about their specialty and it was the usual business advice in that, you know, like here's someone who says, I'm so smart and I'm so rich and here's what you should do, which is fine. But uh, there's never anything for someone in my position. So I actually wrote an email to the editor and said, I love your blog. Uh, it's very interesting. But you don't have any contributors who talk about failure and what it's, you know, what happens when a business goes under and that's about to happen to me, and uh, I'm willing to write about it. And I made that offer because I was thinking literally that, that in a couple of weeks I would have nothing to do, no place to go every day. And I wanted to have something, you know, something to do, and also figured that since I hadn't found any information about this, that it might be useful to try to share it. So I sent this email, and I got no reply, of course. Yeah. And uh, and a couple of weeks went by and I actually scraped my way through the end of the year and got one big order on New Year's Eve. Oh. <laughs> and we we kept the doors open and the beginning of 2009 was still pretty difficult. But just trickling in business kept me from going out. And then two months after I wrote the email, I actually got a reply from the editor, a guy named Lauren Feldman, who's, uh, who's a good, my good friend now. But he said, wow, you know, I just stumbled across your email. I don't even normally look at my email because it's so full of crap. But I saw this and it's a really interesting idea. What would you write about? And so I sent him back one and said, oh, my goodness, I've had so many, so many trying experiences, cash flow and, and bad employees and fighting with my partner and, and laying people off and the economy. You know, where do where do we start? So. Long story short, I went up and had coffee with Lauren at the New York Times, and he said, OK, you know, I've never had anybody offer to write this story. It sounds like you're a legitimate business. And if you want to do it, if you can write, you're hired. And I was like, well, OK, I'll give it a go. I'd never been a writer before. 
Um, the only writing I ever did was just emails begging people for money. And uh, so I, I wrote a few sample columns and, and lo and behold, it turns out I'm a decent writer. So I got hired and I started writing for the Times. That's a great story, man. Ah. You know, uh, the thing, uh, there's so many in there. Uh, I wanted you to finish it, but I wanted to jump in like a hundred times. You know, just the the concept of, hey, I'm, I'm, I may be failing here. Maybe I should reach out and start telling people about it is so foreign to most of us because, you know, I, I think the natural thing is just to kind of hunker down and not talk about it. Yeah, because hide hide you, until you're successful. That's uh, right. Yeah. And, right. Well, and, I, I got to say that I made the offer to write anonymously. I thought that oh, that would. Oh, nice. That that would <laughs> this be, makes more sense. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, yeah, that that would be better for me because I could be candid yes. about whatever happened to me. Yes. And it would be better for, you know, whoever's reading it because it wouldn't just be bullshit. And yeah. the the issue we ran into is that the Times does not publish anonymous content. Oh. And so uh, when the offer came to write, it was like, put your name on it or go away. And yeah. uh, so I was like, eh, what the hell? You know, I, I've never really gotten into any trouble by telling the truth. So yeah. Uh, I decided to just write it and and put my name on it and own it. And uh, and it's turned out to be a very interesting experience because the opportunity to tell your story in the Times, of course, it's tempting to just turn it into some kind of PR puff stuff. Right. Sure. And yeah. but I hate that. You know, I, I hate reading it and I don't want to I don't want to use this incredible piece of luck to to just do something stupid like that. So I decided to really write what my life is about and yeah. not to tell people, oh, here's, here's, you know, I'm so smart, you should do this. I just tell people what I did. I say, here's what I, here was my problem. This is what I did. This is how it turned out, you know, and then comment. And uh, because it's an online forum, there was a, a way for, for the readers to enter into the dialogue and to add their own thoughts. And it turned out to be, really a very, very popular part of the paper and uh, just a tremendous learning experience for me because if you've never tried this, just simply writing down a description of your problems is is really good uh, way to think about them. If you have to communicate succinctly, here's what's going on, it, it clarifies your thoughts about it. And, and it's not just what you put on the paper, but also what you have to leave out. It makes yeah. you think about the complexity of problems in a whole different way. So uh, I ended up writing for the Times for more than four years, and then eventually they killed the blog, and that's a long story I don't want to go into. But <laughs> right. um, it ended, and uh, Lauren, my editor, moved on to Forbes, and he's now running the Forbes website, the uh, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Coverage. And I write for him occasionally. I don't write as much as I did for the Times just because I don't have as much bandwidth these days to devote to writing. Sure. But um, but yeah, it was it was incredible. And it was an yeah. incredible piece of luck that put me there. And I got to say that imagine I've got to give a big shout out to the Times because they basically let someone who had no credentials as a journalist and no, you know, no real background in writing access to their to their paper. You know, like I yeah. got to write for them so that when I wrote something, people paid attention to it. And that was really an amazing opportunity. Yeah. It's great that they recognize the value of being, you know, really hearing your story, not just another, Hey, I've, I've done so great. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. People so, criticize the times a lot, but I got to say that that's, a, that's an amazing piece of institutional imagination on their part. I, I agree. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious about something that you said. And and, and uh, you know, it's uh, we know that the path has worked out for you. But, it, you know, you said at the at the end of 2008 and even the beginning of 2009, you know, you were just keeping going because business was trickling in. And in retrospect, would it have been better to just kill it and start something new? Um, because I've, oh. I, we've all been in that, in that scenario where business is trickling in. You're like, wait a minute, wh you know, I'm hanging on by a thread, but it can, would this energy be worth it somewhere else? So I'm just curious as to your, your perspective on that. 
Well, I got to say that, that that sounds like very West Coast thinking to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, yeah, I'm an the, East the Coast whole, guy, so, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, OK, yeah. so I got it wrong. But, you know, the whole fail fast and, and, yeah. and to market and all that, that to me is is advice that that really doesn't translate to most small businesses and the way most people get into small businesses. You know, my business is my life and all my fortune is committed to it. And the mere act of trying to extract myself from the current business and get to something else, your 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 premise and your remark is that the extraction process is relatively pain free. And that is not going to happen for me. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, I think all of us. Well, and, I, and I, 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 yeah, I don't yeah. necessarily. I, I agree with you. In, in yeah. fact, a hundred percent. And my history, uh, having the same business for you know nineteen almost twenty years, uh, attests to that. Because we've been through periods where we've hung on by a thread. Right. Uh, I, I'm just curious if I, if you feel like I did the right thing. I was looking yeah. more for a little validation. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, well, let me let me put a different spin on it. That I think that. One of the things that every every entrepreneur, every business owner should know is what does failure actually look like? In other words, uh, you you define a line that you're not willing to cross. And to me, that means uh, basically losing my house, that if I had to sign away my house and I was heading for a situation where someone was going to call that in and I was going to be homeless, then I had to turn around. Now I have never quite gotten there. I've gotten, I can, I've gotten to within inches of that line, but I never got there. And that's my personal, don't go past that. Hey there. I hope you're enjoying listening to Paul Down's story on the small business show. When we come back, you'll hear how Paul decided to write boss life and how his focus on sharing his failures made all the difference in his success. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Text Expander. Take it away, Dave. All right. I want to talk about our first sponsor today, which is Text Expander at textexpander.com slash podcast. If you've listened to this podcast for a little while, you already know that Shannon and I love Text Expander, both for our personal lives and for our businesses. Text Expander allows you to take all those bits of text, it could be something short, like an email address or a physical address, or it could be something very long, like a customer service response that you might have for, you know, a specific thing. Maybe you've got some frequently asked questions that come in and you want to blast those back out. It could be anything of any length and it stores these for you and lets you invoke them with either the click of a mouse or even better, the type of a keystroke. So for example, you know, I have one, one of our businesses is backbeat media. I have one called BBM post, which automatically pulls together a very specific and handcrafted and carefully crafted reply to a certain type of email that we get. And it's great because I don't need to worry. Am I giving these people exactly the right information that I need them to have? And is it vetted? And am I sure that I'm not speaking out of turn. No, of course I'm not because I'm using exactly the thing that I have crafted over time and it gets sent out as soon as I do that. So when I get one of these emails in, instead of it taking me, you know, three minutes to go through and make sure it's all right, it takes me three seconds. This is where text expander rocks. It gets better. It syncs to all of your devices, Mac OS, iOS, Windows, and even on the web, it gets better. You can support teams with text expander which means you can sync those snippets the ones you want just the ones you want in fact with everyone on your team so instead of it just being you that can turn three minutes into three seconds everybody can and if you make a tweak to that one little snippet everybody gets it check it out go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download it our thanks to text expander and the folks at smile for sponsoring this episode. All right. Well, let's get back to the show and get into the genesis of why Paul Downs decided to write Boss Life. Here we go. Are you willing to sacrifice your own personal health? Right. Are you someone who uh, would rather work for an extra four hours and not do that jog or that walk or you're going to hit five whiskeys when you get home as opposed to not doing that? I mean, everybody's got... 
got bad places that they can drift into. And part of being a clear thinker, which is, I think, incredibly important for any business owner, is knowing what that looks like and, and deciding to stay away from it. And so, as I said, I never got to that moment. And I don't want to say that your decisions that you made uh, were right or wrong because sure. those were your choices. Sure. Right. Well, well, this is why I think the the book is so valuable uh, is because you know your your perspective is often or is quite different from you know a lot of business folks that we that we talk about so where you're willing to really look at that, you know, okay, what, how far am I, you know, willing to go down, you know, the, the, the rabbit hole, whether it's debt or whatever, and in your case, you know, your house, um, which I think gives you an, an opportunity, especially uh, to share it with other, you know, business owners that uh, one of the things that I think struck me, uh, one part in the book where you went to a, you know, a business round table meeting that you had joined and you were explaining how you were having all these problems. And these other guys were like, no, that's ridiculous. We're not having those problems. And, you know, I, I often feel the same way, you know, where there's often no one around me that I could share. And, and I'm often uh, fearful uh, quite frankly, that I'm going to say, well, my business isn't doing very well. And all these other people, just like happened in your case, you're going to say, well, you're screwed up because our businesses are killing it. You know, and you read so much about success and, uh, you know, in all these publications that quite often I think these, you know, small business owners are sitting there in a bubble going, well, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. So though, I think that you're slightly mischaracterizing that episode in the book. So what I was talking about was it was a meeting of my Vistage group, which is right. uh, fellow small business owners. And that particular group, yes, in this particular instance, they were saying, hey, it's not just the bad economy that's causing your problems. It's you that's causing your problems. But those guys also share their problems with me. Yeah. And I think that uh, it's really easy before you've reached out to other business owners to assume that you're just going to run into this wall of, uh, oh, you know, what, what's the matter with you? Why are you having problems? We never have any problems. That, And my experience in having communicated with now thousands of small business owners through the Times or through the book or just by talking to them is that once you can once you can say, hey, wait a minute, I have problems. I've never met anybody who didn't have problems also. And right. and part of that is that I don't hang around with the Bill Gates style entrepreneurs. I hang around with the guys who own like a local pizza shop or a yeah. plumbing distribution, like real businesses. And and I think that there's really a tremendous amount of help and support to be gained by talking to your peers as long as you approach it honestly. Um, and I I I'm sort of amazed that this dialogue doesn't happen more readily or the possibility the possibility of it is not more widely acknowledged but it it really seems like a breakthrough concept to say from one business owner to another hey i have problems it's amazing yep. that that's so novel it shouldn't be it, it should be, be. i would agree yeah yeah well I, that, I mean and i think that's that's cultural I, I mean, that's that's America. <laughs> it's not just the business owners. It's everybody. You know, there's certainly and, and perhaps that's an East Coast mentality um, that, you know, that that we're all guilty of is is it's it's very easy to just say, oh, yeah, you know, p push those down deep and don't worry about them. That's, you know, yeah, it's, it's unhealthy. But, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Who wins? Like who no, wins? No if, nobody. If people, nobody. Yeah. If people who are thinking of entering a business have a, a an incorrect picture of what it's like. And if people who are running a business feel worse than they should because they have problems, like who's the winner there? And so why can't we talk about these things candidly? It would just help everybody. It would. And I, I'm amazed it that it's not it, again, <laughs> that it's not the go to conversation when you're talking about business. Yeah. And that, you know, that brings up a, a question. So we talk about books here all the time, you know, like the E-Myth, you know, getting started and what you can expect and how to set up, uh, you know, different different aspects of your, of your small business. And, you know, as I was reading, you know, the book, it, you know, it really hit home with me because uh, I felt uh, lots of similar instances having been in business for, you know, 25 years. 
would you would you advise uh, that or say that this is a, a good book for a new business owner to read as well, or is it something where you know they're going to look at this and go, "Wow, I, I'm not sure I can I can take this." You know, well. Yes. I mean, it is a good book for a new business owner, but we should probably explain what the book is. I don't think. Yeah, yeah please. So I, I skipped the, ahead. The yeah, book, please do. Yeah. The book came out of the, the blog, but it's not a replication of it. So I had been writing for a couple of years and I was approached by a literary agent and said, do you want to write a book? And I was like, sure, I'll write a book. And, you know, why not? Um, and then. So because it was I had the possibility then of taking a book to market without a great deal of work on my part. All I had to do was write the book. And so I was like, okay, well, what book have I never read that I want to read? And it's the one which talks about what it's like to experience running a business, not just a bunch of advice, because there's a zillion books and a lot of them are very good. But like, what is it like to be me? And I had found in writing for the blog that I was able to touch on a lot of aspects of what my life is like, but I always had to pull a, a little problem out and write about it in an isolated way. And that is not at all the way my, my day actually goes. The, you know, generally, I go in in the morning and I've got a list of 10 things I need to do. And I start working on them. And by the middle of the morning, five other things have walked in my office door that are problems that need to be dealt with. And you know, at the end of the day, my day is nothing like what I planned it. And it goes like that always, that, that yeah. you have unexpected events and that the running of the business is a narrative. It's kind of like a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you have good days, sometimes you have bad days. And that's what the life is really like. So I wrote a book that was a uh, record of a whole year of my business. What are the challenges I went through? And of course, not every one because it would be a phone book, but uh, just taking out the narrative of, of we started off in a pretty good position and then sales collapsed in the spring. And what did I do about it and how did I think about it? And then we sort of got out of it at the end of the year. And the value of that, as, as I've heard from many hundreds of business owners who contacted me, is just having someone say, yeah, this is what it looks like. And, and, and so that they were able to say, Oh, when my life looks like that, I don't necessarily need to feel like a failure. Yeah. That's just what it is. So if you were thinking of running a business and you'd never done it, I think that this would be a very valuable thing to read because you might, you know, it's like, OK, this is a version of what your life is going to look like. And you're going to have challenges and uh, prepare yourself because they're real challenges. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that that. 2012 span I, I i think if you're talking about i mean it, it wasn't even just the narrative but the, the detail was really helpful and the cash flow and like oh it, you know here's how much we have in the bank today and then at the next chapter here's how much i have now at the beginning of this month that's the stuff that you know we all deal with on a daily basis is how much cash is just the lifeblood of your business uh so it's it's, it's powerful and and a uh, I, I agree with you. I think it is a great book to read if, as a new business owner. Uh, much more powerful than here's another success story of, about Paul Downs, right? Uh, it, it, you know, hopefully your next year was great, but this is is a, a powerful snapshot of hey, this is going to happen to you at some point, and th and this is how you power through it. Yeah, and I got to say that that I always try to include the numbers in whatever I'm talking about. If I'm talking about what people get paid, I say what they get paid. When I talked about my own business in the Times, uh, eventually I got around to telling everybody how much money I made and just published it right there in the Times because you can't really have real conversations about business without talking about money. And you can't talk about money without talking about numbers. And so it drives me crazy to read advice from people who say, oh, I did so much better with this particular technique. And they don't tell you what, yeah, what how much the money they were making when they started yeah. and how much when they ended. Like, what do you even mean? So uh, so I do that in my writing. And that's a big part of the book is including the actual dollar figures of how much we had in the in the bank. And just in case that sounds like it's the most boring book ever. Uh, I hope it's not because it's a really no. sort of an interesting story that there was a real story to that year. It, it was. And, and, you know, as uh, throughout that, you know, you just kind of you describe challenge after challenge, you know, 
professionally for your business, but also personally with, with you know, or with so many of us, you, you can't have the discussion about your small business without including your personal life because it impacts it. And, you know, when I, when I was reading, you know, the, the challenges you went through, I could just see, you know, so many people I think would have just given up and, but you just continued to power through the obstacles, which we talk about on the show a lot, you know, and, and maybe you already answered this, but you know, what drives you each day or what drove you during that, you know, challenging year to just keep powering through? What was it? Where'd you get the energy to keep moving forward? Well, I'll tell you, I've been in business 30 years now and, uh, the, I don't want to fail. (laughs) <laughs> frankly yeah, that's great i really don't and that that is a, a large motivator that that figure out how to have the doors open tomorrow is probably 50 percent of success that if the doors are open tomorrow you've made it another day you're, you're doing okay and uh yeah i have personal challenges that i talk about in the book that i have a, a son with a, with severe autism and that certainly affects my life. Everybody has personal challenges, you know, whatever yes, flavor yes. it comes in. And again, that's part of, of the reality of running a business is you can't just pretend that stuff doesn't exist. Now, on the on the flip side, so fear of failure is a motivator, but I've also found enormous satisfaction in actually just doing my business, that I really like the product I make, Uh, I really like the people I work with. I get to work, you know, I've hired a great team of craftsmen and designers. I like our customers. Uh, We're in a business where people don't buy my product because they're afraid or they, you know, they're forced into it. They only buy it because they want it. So the, the transactions tend to be good. And I really like, have enjoyed the opportunity to build a company that has the kind of culture that I want. Uh, which is a place where good, hardworking people can come to work and, and do something good and respect each other and bring home enough money to participate in the American economy as solid middle class citizens. So to the to the extent that I've been able to do great work with good clients and 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 uh, lead my employees on a path to pr- prosperity, uh, that's really a big motivator to me to keep that going. Nice. Yeah, very well said. And you were certainly preaching to the choir on this show. Uh, I think that's that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so w- the book focuses on 2012. Uh, how have things been for you, you know, since then? The business, you know, you're still there and do, doing that good work and creating that culture. and, and Yeah, still there. Uh, 2012, we did about $2.1 million in business. 2013, we went to 2.9. It's a pretty big jump. Yeah. 2014, 2.75, and 2015 last year was a little bit difficult. We we fell back to two and a half, and we're on track to do about three this year. So that span of years is pretty much like any five-year span. There were some good ones. There were some bad ones. There were some good days. There were some bad days. Yeah. And uh, I'm still here, and I'll be here for a good long while, I hope, until yeah. I, I can retire or sell the business. For sure. That's great. So- you know, we, we talk about mistakes a lot on this show and, you know, we've talked about them here as well. Is, is there something, you know, that, that kind of stands out for you in, you know, when we say the best mistake you might've made something that you really learned, you know, uh, a, a great lesson in your business that, that happened at some point that you can share with the listeners? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, <laughs> I have the same, <laughs> like, yeah, I have that problem. Where do you start? But, uh, <laughs> Um, the one that's probably most applicable to all businesses is understanding profitability. And I, I went for, for many, many years before I really understood it because I'm not much of a businessman and uh, not really financially sophisticated. That's not why I got into my line of business. And, uh, and it's not to say that once I understood it, it became easy to, to make money. But now at least I have that as a goal and I have an understanding of how my business does make money. And I think that anybody who's running a business, particularly if you're starting a business, the first question would be, who's going to pay me on an ongoing basis for whatever I am selling? You know, like, how do I get people to continually send me money? And then the second one would be, how do I take that stream of cash and provide whatever I'm promising to provide and have some left over at the end of the day? 
And if you can answer those two questions, you're you're on your way. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, man. Very, <laughs> yeah, good. that's good advice. It it's um, I, and I feel like it's important for everyone at your business to at least understand that those are the questions. That that you as a business owner and you as their employer need to answer, because I've had some people that don't quite grok uh, that the goal is to create something of such value that the same person wants to pay for it over and over again. And and mm-hmm. that that's a a key thing that if people that work for you don't get it, you're they they, they might not be able to keep, stay working for you. Yeah. Well, I'd say the one one aspect of that is how candid are you with your employees about how the business works? Yeah. Now, I I spent the first quarter century in my business basically being the only one in the room who understood the numbers and I I internalized quite a lot of stress because of that. And then after I started writing for the Times, I realized, hey, sharing information about my life is not going to kill me. And I started sharing the numbers with my employees. In other words, telling them uh, how much money we had on the bank in any given day and how much had come in and how much it was going out and how much money I took home. And it was really an eye opener for them because they had no idea. They just had no concept of what kind of money was involved. And once I was willing to share that information with them. They started thinking about the business in a whole different way. So now that we all, we all at least understand theoretically what should happen, we can have a mature discussion about, you know, how we're doing and uh, why they may or may not be able to have that raise or we can or can't buy this piece of equipment or anything really now they're informed and so that my dialogue with them can be much more productive yeah yeah it's 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 not so much just a mature conversation but like you said an in, an, an informed mature conversation yeah hmm. no i don't i don't think that that every business owner should necessarily assume they have to do this but sure. in my business we we have employees who i plan to have employed for a long time you know they make a commitment to the company as much as I make a commitment to them. And so that the health of the company and the health of the employees is basically the same thing. Right. Now, if I was running an ice cream stand and I hired a bunch of high school kids for three months every summer, I wouldn't bother to share numbers with them. And because yeah, of course. They're of not going to be around. And, no, and every business is different and every business owner has to make a decision that makes sense for them. That's great. Yeah, it's a fascinating story and and uh, one that I I really you know thank you for sharing with all of us because it's very valuable and I will continue to mention it here on the show and uh, you know we, we will link it you know uh, often and whenever we mention it. Um, what's the best way for for folks to uh, learn more about your business? Well, about my business, they can just Google Paul Downs, that's P-A-U-L-D-O-W-N-S, and I am not the Italian actor. I'm the guy who makes conference tables, <laughs> should be able to tell us apart. And nice. uh, and if they get on my website, they'll learn more than they ever wanted to about conference tables. And if you're looking for the book, yep. it's called Boss Life, Surviving My Own Small Business, and it's available at most bookstores and online. If you Google that, you'll find sources for it. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today. It's been fascinating, and uh, I, uh, I, I I definitely appreciate your time and update us as well. Yeah. Well, thanks, gentlemen. This I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed talking to you. Very good. Paul Downs, everybody, pick up a copy of Boss Life, and uh, you will uh, reap the benefits for sure. Thanks for joining us, Paul. This was fun. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. You know where you can find us, of course, businessshow.co on the web and on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash 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 businessshow.co. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we will hear from you. You will hear from us next uh, next week. Have Take a good care, one, everybody. Folks. Yep. Keep living that charmed life.